Good evening, everyone. I'm going to take my hat off. It is very hot. Okay. Uh, my name's Paul Webley. I'm the uh, director of SIAS. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all this evening in the audience tonight, particularly to those who've travelled a long way, and to Professor Guy Standing's friends, colleagues, and family. Uh, Guy tells me that he has two sons here, and his wife, and his brother. So a particular welcome to you. I also asked Guy if his sons had ever heard him give an academic talk. And he said he wasn't sure that they had. So I think it's an interesting experience for you to see your father in a different sort of light. We have guests from many institutions here tonight. Some people have traveled a long way. It's a very good turnout on a hot evening. And we really appreciate you taking the trouble to be here. Uh, SAS inaugurals are very special. Some institutions these days kind of downgraded their inaugurals, partly because they're so large and they have, have too many professors, frankly. Uh, SAS, however, is still got a really strong community feel and it enables the community to come together and everyone to sort of celebrate. Uh, it's also a sort of enjoyable intellectual event uh, and it's also a route to passage uh, for the speaker. And just to make sure it's an enjoyable event, could you please turn off your mobile phones? And I will do that as well. Okay. And if there is a fire alarm... Um, that means there's a fire. So uh, you'll see there's fire exits there. So if you hear a fire alarm, please go in an orderly manner out of the building. Uh, I'm very pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture. It's the very last inaugural of a very successful 2012-13 inaugural lecture series. Professor Standing joined us last year, and he's been very quick to find his date for an inaugural. I like that. There are some professors... I shan't mention any names, uh, who keep putting it off. Um, they may be made a professor four or five years ago and they've still not given an inaugural. So well done, Guy, for stepping up to the plate quickly. I'm greatly looking forward to his lecture this evening entitled Precariat and Peasant Reframing Social Protection for the 21st Century. I'm sure it's going to be fascinating. Professor Standing will be introduced by Professor John Weeks. John is Professor Emeritus of Development Economics at SAAS. He's an associate of the Centre for Development Policy. He's also a senior researcher for the Institute of African Economic Studies at Addis Ababa University. He has research interests in theoretical and policy applied macroeconomics and development. He's published a very large number in his career of academic papers, books and policy reports in those areas. And to maintain the SOAS theme, the vote of thanks will be given by Professor Nyla Kabir, also from SOAS. Uh, she gave her own inaugural lecture uh, not so long ago as Professor of Development Studies here at SOAS and an associate editor of uh, Feminist Economics. She's carried out research, teaching and advisory work in the interrelated fields of gender, social exclusion, labour markets and livelihoods, social protection and citizenship. We're very grateful to both of you uh, for being here this evening and to making this event special. Uh, so thanks very much. After Nyla has given the vote of thanks, you'll be invited upstairs to a reception in the Brunei suite for some wine and canapes. And now, to pass on to the kind of main meet of the evening, I'll pass over to Professor Weeks to introduce Professor Standing. Over to you, Job. Normal practice is that the person who introduces the speaker is more distinguished than the speaker himself. In this case, it's quite the reverse, uh, and it is a great honor to introduce um, uh, Guy Standing and um, assure you that you are in for an extremely interesting and intellectually challenging evening. I think the best thing I can do, given my <laughs> modest claims to fame, is to be brief. and. Um, I would like to bring out an aspect of Guy's work that, um, or his life really, that uh, is unlikely to be stressed, and that is, as some of you may know, it is impossible to be innovative and controversial in a United Nations organization. Guy Standing is the exception that proves that rule in spades because he has been both innovative and controversial in the best sense, and, as you might say, great 
cost to his time and uh, effort uh, because in any organization, even more so in the United Nations, it is a day-to-day -day struggle. If you spend one day being innovative and controversial, you have to spend the other 364 apologizing for it, and Guy never has apologized for it. I'll just mention three major contributions that he made, uh, all of which I know quite well. Uh, we worked together closely a number of times, most and most concentrated form on a very well-known um, uh, report on the labor market in South Africa, which, like so many things Guy has done, is path-breaking. I'll only use that word once, or I'll have it, I'll, I will have said it many, many times. <clears throat> I would point out three things that are worth you knowing about. One is beginning in the late 1970s and into the 1980s, the, there began to be a change in developed countries in employment patterns in which the security of employment declined. Uh, Guy uh, was, if he may or may not have been uh, the first person to recognize that, that's not important. He was the first person to recognize how important it was and to put it in context. And to this end, <coughs> he um, it probably turned out, I think, his many reports on labor flexibility in different countries. Second thing I would mention is soon after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the cha political changes in Eastern Europe, it, we ban began to get a hint that there were going to be major labor redundancies. Again, Guy may not have been the person who first recognized this, but he was the person who provided the standard analytical and empirical basis for discussing it in a series of books, the best known of which is Reviving Dead Souls. I think I got the title correct. And third, a constant theme, continuous theme in his work over decades has been various versions of the universal of universal income schemes, which is now, I think, would be correct to say, matured or crystallized into what are called unconditional, or unfortunately, in, in other people's usage of it, uh, conditional cash transfers. And this has become a major area of funding for donors, and I think the inspiration, much of the inspiration for it comes from Guy Standing. Um, I'll finish by saying that it's been a great pleasure working with him, and it is a great pleasure introducing him, and it will be a great pleasure to you to hear him speak. Well, after an introduction like that, it makes you feel suddenly very old. And that's the first thought. And of course, becoming a professor is a part of the rite to passage that uh, Paul mentioned. And this evening, what I'm going to try to do is draw on some of my work and pre present a perspective for policy thinking about social protection going forward. And I'd like to dedicate the talk to the brave people who are in Istanbul today resisting dictatorship and they will be seen in the future as part of the global precariat, which I was what I'm going to be talking about. So I dedicate my talk to them. Now, an inaugural is a rare opportunity to be mischievous, say things that your friends and relations will nod and say, oh, he's gone a bit far on that one and your enemies nod sagely and look at each other and say, see, I knew he was mad all the time. Chris Kramer asked me last week if I had a text because he looked forward to reading it. Well, I have news for him, I didn't respond. There is no text. 
And I think in that sense, I would recommend this to all future professors. Don't have a text, and then you will be able to say with Nietzsche, my memory says I said it. My pride says I didn't. My memory yields. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do is start with a premise which I've used on many occasions with students, and I still find it difficult to convince people in the social scientists, in the social sciences and in politics to move in this direction. Every age has had its stupidity in what is work and what is not work. Our age is the most stupid of all. The ancient Greeks had it roughly right, although there was a sexist society and hierarchical and many other defects, but they understood the difference between labor which is what you do for exchange value, and what was done by the non-citizens, the metics, the banosoi, the slaves, and work. Work was what you did in and around the home with your friends and relatives. It was reproductive activity, for philia. And in addition, their sense of time, there was play and recuperation that everybody needed to become rounded human beings. But the real objective of a citizen of ancient Greece was to maximize the amount of time and effort in skolle or sholle, which we use the term leisure to imply, but in those times it meant public participation in the life of the polis, including the vital activity of moral education through participating in theatrical life, the great tragedies of ancient Greece, which taught people a sense of empathy. And that theme of empathy is going to be the main one of my talk this evening. Now, our age, to go a long way forward from the ancient Greeks, and through the stupidities of Adam Smith, the founder of economics, who dismissed all service activities as unproductive, we get to the 20th century, where literally work of all kinds, that is not labor, disappears from statistics, from political rhetoric, and from analysis. And it was epitomized by a pithy saying by Arthur Pigou, who was a professor at Cambridge, my alma mater, when he said that if he hired a housekeeper or a cook, national income went up. If he married her and she continued to do precisely the same work, national income and employment went down. Now, you can't get more stupid than that. Now, I'll come back to the point a bit later but I think you can see the 20th century and all the social protection devices developed in the 20th century as fundamentally affected by laborism, tying entitlements and rights, so-called rights, to the performance and willingness to perform labor, but not other forms of work. And every feminist and every egalitarian should protest vehemently at that continued misuse of the language. The second point I want to make is something that all of us as students, if we've had a drink or two or whatever we've been doing, we sometimes ask, but we forget as we go on through life, the grand questions. What is a good society? What is the type of society that behind a veil of ignorance, in other words, you don't know where you are going to be in the distribution of outcomes, would you wish to leave to your children and your grandchildren? It's a good question. It's a vital question because it teaches us the values. And the second question is, what is it that should be equalized in that good society? Because every theory of justice believes in the equality of something. And I believe 
that the answer to those two questions is that we want a society in which all of us can pursue our enthusiasms through our work and our leisure in communities in which associational freedom, as developed by Aristotle and Hannah Arendt, are preserved and strengthened. The two go together. And that fundamentally, the thing that must be equalized is basic security. Every human being of every society deserves and should have basic security. We've come a long way since anything like that vision was dominating our politics. Now, I want to turn from that to the analysis. Some of you will know it from the books. Some of you will be bored to tears by it, but I apologize briefly. When I left university, social democracy was still triumphant. The battle between that and Soviet communism was still raging. And they collapsed in the late 1970s. What emerged then was a triumph for the Mont Pelerin Society, which we subsequently called the neoliberals. A bunch of 36 renegades after the Second World War formed the Mont Pelerin Society, economists. And they went forward as renegades, and when I was a student, we laughed almost at their work. We regarded them as extremists of the far right whose time had long passed. But they had the last laugh in the 1970s when suddenly they became the gurus of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and a host of others. And no less than eight of that original 36 went on to receive Nobel Prizes in economics. They have become hegemonic. I won't go into their theories other than to say that what they wanted was an individualized market society that was open, liberalized to the world through mass commodification of everything that could be subject to market forces. But most fundamentally and least noticed by analysts is they didn't believe in deregulation. On the contrary, they believed in re-regulation in favor of powerful interests and in the systematic dismantling of all institutions of social solidarity that stood against the market. You cannot understand neoliberalism without understanding that fundamental tenet of all their work. And there is a famous remark made by that woman who was prime minister, whose name I do not wish to repeat, <laughs> who said, there is no such thing as society. It wasn't a slip, except in one respect. What she really should have said, to be completely honest, is that there, is no, there should be no such thing as society. Because fundamentally, if you go back to the early writings of Frederick Hayek, Milton Friedman, and the others, they wanted to dismantle all the institutions of society that were collective and that provided social solidarity. You cannot understand the neoliberal juggernaut that has come to dominate globalization without understanding that basic fact. Now, what we had then in the 1980s is the beginning of a Polanyan global transformation in which liberalization meant the most fundamental change in our modern history, that almost overnight there was a tripling of the world's labor supply. But the extra billions who came on to the global labor market were prepared and habituated to earn 1 50th of what any British person would begin to tolerate. Now, if you liberalize its basic economics, you don't expect to be a professor to know this, you are going to lead to downward pressure on wages and benefits in the rich countries long before the Lewis tipping point emerges where wages and benefits start rising in the emerging market economies. But as I've said before, 
This induced a Faustian bargain by governments of left of center, right of center, all over the world. Because they had to introduce more flexible labor markets. When I first started writing about the growth of labor flexibility, I remember the unions and labor parties refusing to discuss it. They said, we're not going to allow it to happen, it won't happen, and it should be stopped. That was a terrible error. The error should have been corrected, and I'm proud to say that I said it at the time, they should have accepted flexibility as the inevitable consequence of globalization and liberalization of markets. You can't be King Canute stopping the waves. The waves are going to wash you away. The Faustian bargain that was then made by the neoliberals and by the New Labour and Social Dem Democrats elsewhere was that as we allow wages to fall, as we allow benefits to be chipped away, as we allow those labour securities that have been built up in the previous era to get weaker, we will give you cheap credit. We will give you tax credits. We will give you labour subsidies to prop up the system. But like every Faustian bargain, it had to come to an end, and it did so in 2008, and we know the consequences with austerity. They didn't need to make that Faustian bargain. They could have made a Faustian bargain of a completely different kind. They could have said to financial capital and big capital, we are changing the rules, and as a result of changing the rules, your incomes are going to shoot up, not because you're suddenly more clever, but because we're changing the rules. Therefore, it is only just that we have a sharing process of all that financial capital with the people. We didn't do that. Now, what happened then is that as flexibility spread, inevitably, the old Bismarckian and beverage systems of social security collapsed. Because the contributory base faded, and not enough people were getting entitlements to decent state benefits. So the second historical error was made. Country after country, led by Australia, by this country, and by the United States, but then by Sweden and others, moved to means-testing social assistance. Now, means-testing social assistance means, literally, that we're going to target the benefits on the poor, the poorest of the poor, all these euphemisms that emerged. But to do that, of course, you have to have tests, because supposing you say, you, poor over there, are poor because of your own fault. You're a lazy bum, or you haven't trained enough, so we have to have tests to determine whether, in fact, you are a deserving poor. Surprise, surprise, that is exactly what has happened in the ensuing period. Now, the means testing and the flexibility led to the great class fragmentation that has engulfed my own life as an academic as a, and as an activist. I predicted, I looked back at some work, and one doesn't like to say told you so too many times, but back in the 80s, I said that the flexibility insecurity paradigm is going to lead to a multiple form of class fragmentation with different groups having a different relations to the state. What we've seen is the emergence of a plutocracy and an elite way off the stratosphere, a salariat shrinking in numbers but with lovely employment security and bonuses and access to capital, etc., etc., alongside a group of professions who have got burnout written all over them every day of the week, and the old working class for which the welfare state was built shrinking everywhere, and underneath that, the precariat. Now, the precariat is an emerging class in the world. Millions and millions of people are entering the precariat 
and it is providing a new fulcrum for political action. The precariat has a few distinctive characteristics. I'm not going to go into them in detail. The books do that. But I'm just going to list them so that it gives you a picture of who they are and where you are in relation to them. I dare say most of us in this room are pretty close. The first characteristic is that they have distinctive relations of production in Marxian terms. They're casualized, they're outsourced, they've got all sorts of euphemistic names to give them chronic labor insecurity. Now, I don't know what's happened to the circular that, that I produced for this talk, but those of you who are interested in this will be able to get it on email afterwards if you haven't got it now. But what you can do, in fact, is by looking at all these complex forms of insecure labor, you can work out that the number of people in a country like the UK who are in labor slack situations, underutilized in labor terms, and in insecurity, has grown up massively. And the difference between the standard unemployment rate and the rate of labor slack taking account of all these underemployment categories, including zero hours contracts. 23% of all firms in this country today have some people on zero hours contracts. Reminds me of the Soviet system, those dead souls who are on the books but not given any employment. They count as full-time labor, so the statistics look wonderful. But hundreds of thousands are on such contracts. Now, I think that is a feature of the precariat, but it's not the most important. We also find that the precariat has distinctive relations of distribution, by which I mean that the structure of social income of people in the precariat has become much more oriented to money wages. Ironically, because they are losing entitlement to enterprise, non-wage benefits, to state benefits, to all forms of community support, which means that makes them much more insecure and subjects them to the most peculiar feature that we have to address in thinking about social protection, which is that the precariat suffers from chronic uncertainty. Not the classic labor risks that were looked after by Beveridge and Bismarck. Uncertainty is when you don't know the probability of an adverse event hitting you. This uncertainty is fundamentally important for understanding what we need to do in the future. The next feature is that the precariat consists of denizens, not citizens. A denizen is an old concept which we need to revisit, which refers to people who have a more limited range of rights than the citizens around them. This is the first time in history when more and more people are being deprived of rights. They're being deprived of civil rights, cultural rights, social rights, economic and political rights. And you can document that. This is a strange phenomenon when we're turning people into denizens. The next feature, and anybody who deals with people in the precariat or who is in the precariat will understand this point, is that the precariat has a very high ratio of work for labor to labor. You have to fill in endless forms. You have to network. You have to retrain. You have to learn bundles of new tricks. You have to do this. You have to do that. Using up much more time. It's all work, but it doesn't get counted as work. And this produces what I've called the precariatized mind. Now, there are other features, but I won't go into those. But I want to end on that point by saying that the precariat today is a more dangerous class than it was when I was first writing about it. And it has been split into three categories. 
The first category consists of people falling out of all working class communities. They don't have a pride in any occupational identity. They look back atavistically and they see their parents who were dockers, were miners, or something they could have pride in. These people are tending to be atavistic politically and are listening to the sirens of the far right. That's the tragedy. The second group consists of migrants and minorities who have to keep their head down to survive. They're alienated, and every now and then, as we saw in Stockholm a couple of weeks ago, there will be days of rage when it gets too much. And the third group is where the great hope lies. It consists of people who are educated. They were sold a lottery ticket when they went to university, and they know that that lottery ticket is worth less and less, and the debts are higher and higher. And millions of people are experiencing chronic status frustration. This is the first class in history where the level of qualifications is expected to be higher than the quality of the labor they're expected to perform. That is a remarkable feature. Now, this part of the precariat is the part that I find myself addressing in many places at the moment. And it can be summed up beautifully by a piece of graffiti. Graffiti is always very useful for us humble academics. It was a beautiful piece on a Madrid wall which said the worst thing would be to go back to the old normal. Because this part of the precariat doesn't look back nostalgically and wanting to have 30 years of stable labor in some boring job that stretches into the future until they retire with some golden watch or something. They want to work. They want to develop their capabilities, and they want to create and recreate communities around an ecological perspective. Everywhere you go, you find the same sort of elements. I must mention, in this passing point, peasants. It's in the title, and you'll see the relevance later. Peasants have some similarities to the precariat in the sense as Richard Tawney famously said, they live with their heads just above water. What marks them out in most countries, and particularly in those countries where I've worked, is they experience chronic debt. And they're faced by monopolists of the scarcest resource of all, which is called money. And as a result, the moneylenders and the landlords and the ration shop owners can charge for tiny loans, loan shark rates of interest, to put them further into debt and into bonded labor. What characterizes most peasant communities is chronic uncertainty. And we wrote a book on Gujarat where we did a huge survey, and what we found was that the way commercialization was restructuring social income of people was making them more uncertain and removing many forms of social support that were informal but at least reliable in, in adversity. The uncertainty of those communities has grown dramatically. Now let me reflect on how social protection policy has evolved in this period of globalization. Because I think the fundamental truth is that we have become much more utilitarian. This is the triumph of utilitarianism in a way that Jeremy Bentham could not have predicted with any sense of certainty when he was writing at the end of the 18th century. And what we've seen with utilitarianism or majoritarianism, if you wish, is a sense in which we, the virtuous people, the majority who must be made happier, can be allowed to grow happier while making the lives of the minority, 
who are those inconvenient them less and less pleasant. Jeremy Bentham, as you probably know, also wrote the Panopticon Papers, which every student of social science should read because they are chilling and highly relevant today. The Panopticon Papers was basically to say that people must be given the appearance of having a choice, but to have no choice. And if they made the wrong choice, which was not to labor, they would be punished. That's the essence of the Panopticon Papers. Now we have seen a modern version of this developing since the 1980s. The latest euphemism by which the Panopticon state has been taking shape is called libertarian paternalism. I always say at this point, and I'll say it again without apology, which is that if you have a bath regularly, like I do, it's the sort of book, Nudge, written by these two American authors, which you should take into the bath because it will keep the bath water hot, will raise your blood pressure. <laughs> if it doesn't, you're well on the right. <laughs> the irony is that Obama, when he was elected president, appointed one of, his, one of the authors of this book as his chief regulator in the White House. And when David Cameron was elected prime minister, one of the very first things he did was appoint the other author. I suppose he got the second author, you know, the cheapie. <laughs> and set up in Downing Street a little shadowy unit called the Behavioral Insights Unit, which has since been called the Nudge Unit. And the idea of the Nudge Unit is to steer people to make the right choice. So they're using all sorts of techniques, all sorts of tests to get people, particularly people who are in the precariat, to make the right choice. And guess what comes with that? If you don't make the right choice, watch it. Now, this model of utilitarianism believes in insecurity. It believes that insecurity motivates people to labor, to save, to invest, to take risks. It's almost a crude Darwinian model. It rejects any sense of social solidarity. And I've written an article which didn't make me many friends with my religious friends, as it were, pointing out that a remarkable fact about those who've been pushing the workfare agenda, the utilitarian agenda, is their incredible religious convictions that drives them. Ian Duncan Smith is a converted Catholic. Tony Blair, who led the way, a converted Catholic. The man that David Cameron introduced to Downing Street as his first advisor on social protection reform, the man I've crossed swords with several times in my own career, Larry Mead. Now, Larry Mead has written a number of texts in which he said religious people should be the social policy people. And what we need to do is to induce the unemployed and the benefit claimants to blame themselves. They must blame themselves. He has written that and said it. So instead of a world in which we see people drifting into disadvantaged situations and needing compassion and needing our empathy, we are to get them to blame themselves. A lot stems from that. Now, I think there should be a prize, an annual prize, maybe we could call it the SOAS Prize, Paul, for the most toxic political speech of the year. <laughs> Last year, there was only one candidate that I could think of. It was a speech by our esteemed prime minister in a Kent supermarket arcade, in which he made, in his own words, 17 proposals for welfare reform. 
I advise anybody who thinks they may be near the precariat to read that speech on 24th of June last year. Because essentially it was about punishing people who are in the precariat. Punishing. Because that was the way to their reform, to their redemption. It's very, very clear. I, if I were giving a long treatise and it was in a text, I wouldn't say it quite like that. But essentially that is what is happening. And underneath this, is the single most important aspect of the precariat which has not been given sufficient attention, which is the people in the precariat are supplicants. They are supplicants in the sense they're reduced to begging, expecting discretionary charity, either from a private or a public or a semi-private commercial company dealing with them. And that discretion gives the bureaucrats, whether private or public, tremendous power, which induces anxiety and all the other things that I would like to talk about, but I won't. Because the end game of the utilitarian model, and I predicted this in 1990, because it seemed to me obviously and evident, you go for flexibility and you go for means testing and then you look for the deserving and the undeserving and you go down that road, you have to end up with workfare. Now, workfare literally means compelling the losers in society to do labor that they would not otherwise choose to do. I'll come back briefly at the end. Now, what would a progressive alternative look like? Because that's where we are today. The utilitarians are hegemonic. I'm cutting out a bit of my speech on that, but I assure you, you can document it in great detail. But what would make a progressive social protection model? I think we must start by saying we need to resurrect the sentiment of compassion. You feel the suffering of other people. And you say, those people are humans as I am, and it's unacceptable. When you hear that the disabled are having their benefits cut, where they're no longer able to repair the equipment in their houses because benefits have been cut, any progressive should have a sense of rage. But the real virtue of a progressive approach is empathy. A sense of feeling that I and you are brothers and sisters, and I may not be the same as you, but you have as much right as I do to pursue my idea of a good life. The sense of empathy which the ancient Greeks taught through their great tragedies, our literature, our Dickens, our Shakespeare, and whatever, taught us empathy. If you lose the sense of empathy, you lose your humanity, and you cease to be a progressive. Now, we know, the psychologists have told us, that inequality erodes empathy. It leads to a sense of detachment, a feeling that their problem is their problem. <laughs> Mine, I can do very well. The empathy has been eroded, and in particular, the plutocracy and the salariat and the professions, they don't empathize with the precariat because they haven't been there. They don't know what the daily humiliations that they have to experience is like. They don't know the anxiety that bites when you don't know where your next meal is coming from. But that's the sort of society we've created today. Every single day, and it's rising, over half a million Britons are trekking to what we call soup kitchens for homeless, and the number is going up. Watch those numbers. It's been dramatically weakened, this sense of empathy, by the dismantling of occupational guilds, of occupational communities. 
I documented this in the last but one book that I've written. The systematic dismantling of occupational communities that had been built up as guilds for many, many centuries. New labor made a bonfire of them, tore them up, stripped them, turned to licensing by occupational boards, and ruined the sense of community that reproduced the social memory and the ethics. Now I want to come to the conclusions. What would be the elements of a progressive strategy that emphasizes empathy, compassion, and social solidarity. Remember that the great lesson of Darwin was not the survival of the fittest through being more competitive than everybody else. The survival depended on having a sense of social solidarity with inherent reciprocities and altruism for our kind. In our case, our kind is everybody. Now, the 10 points I want to end on are elements of an empathy strategy. The first, you will not be surprised, is we will need to reconceptualize work. We need to legitimize and reward and dignify all forms of work equally. The unpaid care that we give to our frail relatives, the unpaid work we do in the community, the unpaid work that we do ecologically to reproduce our society must be given exactly the same respect as any other form. It is ridiculous that if you have a job pouring tea for the boss, you're called productive and you're satisfying the duty to labor. Whereas if you're looking for a frail relative, you're not working. What a ridiculous idea. We need to force our statisticians, our politicians, to change dramatically. And in that regard, I urge all of you to read another candidate for toxic speech of the year, which comes from a rather different source. It's Ed Miliband's recent speech on welfare reform from earlier this month. If you look at it and read it carefully, it contains three elements. One, that's a stupid little one, but why, why, why use it? You're making a, a, a big speech about the future of welfare. And his first proposal is we're going to force all mothers of three-year-olds to do job preparation training. And if they don't, they'll lose their benefits. What sort of idiotic idea is that? <laughs> the second idea is that we will not allow people to be unemployed for more than a certain time. They will all be forced to do labor, to go into a job. And by the way, it will be a minimum wage job. At the same time, he and his colleagues are saying we must go for a living wage, a living wage for everybody. But he would put the unemployed into menial, dead-end jobs that would leave them in the poverty trap. What sort of idea is that? And the third idea is to return, so the Labour Party says, to the contributions principle. Read carefully, and the only losers in that will be the precariat, because they will not get into the circumstances where they've got five years of continuous contribution or five years of contributions, full stop. So it actually will be regressive. Now, that leads me next to the second point. We must overcome poverty traps and what I call precarity traps. We have created a society in which every day politicians say we must lower the taxation of the middle class. We must lower taxation on corporations. And we must have taxes set by utilitarian criteria of giving incentives. So they say, 
the salariat must have no higher tax rate than 45%. It could go lower, but we say 45%. At the same time, they've announced they have a strategy for lowering corporation tax, that is the tax that corporations pay on their profits, to 20%. Okay, what tax does the precariat pay? Well, according to official calculations by this government and the last government, if you go from a meager benefit into a low-paying job, your effective tax rate is over 80%. I.e., your low-income groups are expected to pay a tax rate four times what our big corporations pay. And of course, they get a lot of subsidies as well, so they don't really pay 20%. We know that. But even on paper, that is wrong. But in addition, the precariat faces not just poverty traps, where they have no incentive to take labor, very little, 20% of anything they gain, right? You also have to remember they have precarity traps to overcome. If you are in the precariat, you have to go and queue for benefits. You have to satisfy this test, that test, this another test, go back, have the wrong papers, come back, queue again, be deferential to some little boy who doesn't know what he's doing, and he's equally frightened because he's in the precariat too. We laugh. But that is the reality. That is the reality. And you're finding that job centers and other so-called welfare agencies are being rewarded and incentivized to maximize the number of sanctions they introduce. Don't believe me, look it all up in the literature. It's exactly what they're doing. And in the process, this precarity trap of queuing and trying to apply, doing the wrong forms, coming back again, being humiliated again, joining another queue. In the end, you might get your benefit. Not very much. Your debts have built up. Your situation has deteriorated. You probably lost your rented accommodation. And then along comes the job centre young man, and he says, we found the other side of London a job, a minimum wage job. It's a casual job. may not last more than three or four weeks. Take it. None of us in this room would regard it as rational to do that. Not only you would be facing the poverty trap, but you'd be back in the precarity trap within weeks. We should have a rage against that. And that leads to the next point, which is part of any progressive strategy. We need a revival of respect for due process. It sounds very dull. But if you're in the precariat and you're a supplicant, you find every day that somebody, somehow, can take away your entitlements with impunity. They are doing it regularly. Millions of people are living with this threat and experiencing the reality. Now, due process goes back to Magna Carta. It's fundamental to our, our civilization. Yet there is no due process. There's no legal aid to help people when they're, have, they're, they're sanctioned and they don't have any way of getting it back. We don't find that the people doing the sanctions are held to the same rules as they hold others to. In my view, when Atos makes one of its many, many errors, it should be penalized. And the person who has the benefit deducted and it subsequently proved that that was wrong, should be compensated, not just have the benefit back. Where is the rage from our supposed progressive politicians about due process? As for workfare itself, I think most of us, if we were faced by a bureaucrat saying, I am sending you to work in an Amazon warehouse, a Tesco supermarket, a sewage, or whatever. You have to do it. Otherwise, we take your benefit away. I could say, look, if I do that, I will lower my lifetime income expectations because 
I will be downgraded as a worker, as a person. Doesn't matter, you have to take it. Now, I defy any of us here to say that this is a policy born of empathy, of compassion. It isn't, and it can never be. And I can imagine myself snarling with rage and saying, up with this I will not put, or words to that effect. We should do that more systematically. The worst thing of all in regard to workfare was recently two young students, you probably all know this story, if not it should be ingrained in our collective memory. They were forced to do virtually unpaid labor because they were unemployed and they took the government to court. And they said, look, it's, it's, it's not law, it's not a, a law that we have to do this. It's wrong. And the courts ruled in their favor. And what did the government do? The government rushed through emergency legislation within two days. You're only meant to do emergency legislation when there's a national crisis. Bombs are dropping. Think how they ignored that. They rushed through this emergency legislation, making the offence retrospective. So that if you had refused and been st had your benefits stopped, you couldn't claim those benefits, even though you weren't breaking the law. Now this is a fundamental principle of British civilization. It went like that. But what was equally scandalous was that the opposition our proud representatives of the progressives. They ordered their MPs not to vote against it and made it a resignable offence for all the shadow cameras. The utilitarians in the middle have lost it. Now, I want to skip some points because I'm running out of time and I apologise for that. I think it's very important in this new compassionate approach that we have to strengthen the collective voice of the precariat. That is beginning to happen. It is, the energy is taking place. But I want to conclude, and I hope I don't break down on this point, with a last and fundamental principle of a new progressive social protection. That is that the time has come when we must move towards having a basic income as a universal right of citizenship. Move in that direction. Move away from conditionality. Move away from the utilitarian rationale. Towards a sense of giving people basic security as a right of a civilized society. Now, there are many criticisms which we've dealt with over the years, and there are a number of fundamental principles, and anybody who's interested in this could join our organization, Bien, which has some members here in this room now, which has been promoting a basic income around the world. The argument I like to use is derived from Tom Paine who wrote in 1795. He didn't use the exact words I'm going to use but the point he developed is roughly right. We don't know who contributed to our wealth today. Everybody's income and wealth in this room and any other room is far more due to the efforts of previous generations than anything you or I do ourselves. It's an obvious thing. And basically, the argument for a basic income is it's like a social dividend for the contributions of previous generations to our collective wealth. Because I don't know if it's your father or grandfather or my grandfather who made the contributions. We don't know, if we're honest. Recently, I was invited to Middlesbrough to present the precariat. And some academics took me around the old parts of Middlesbrough. 
Those of you who don't know Middlesbrough, just a brief point or two. In the 1820s, it was a hamlet. Hardly any people there, small holders and so on. And by the 1850s, it had become the great ironworks of the empire. And you will find that most of the Indian railway system was built on the iron ore in Middlesbrough. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is built with the iron ore in Middlesbrough. If you go there today, you will find derelict estates, people in the street, slobbish, without education, without hope, without dignity. And you say to yourself, or you should if you're a progressive, these are the descendants of the people who created the wealth by which those in the South became millionaires and like Ian Duncan Smith has his 1,500 acres of land. They created the wealth. And yet today they get none of it. And we should be very angry about that. And basically the justification for a basic income is that it is a social dividend that we should all share. There are many other reasons for moving in this direction. It will give people a greater sense of control over their time. It will encourage more work rather than labor. It can be used as an automatic macroeconomic stabilizer. And it will strengthen social empathy because it will induce a greater sense of altruism, tolerance, reciprocity. Psychological experiments done in many countries have shown that this is precisely what happens. I want to mention, too, that the illusion of the center is that somehow work, which they mean labor, is the best route out of poverty. Again, they're being canutish. Real wages have been stagnating in, or falling in all the industrialized countries in the past 30 years. And real wages in this country fell in the last five years at a faster rate than at any comparable time in our history, so even faster than in the 1930s. It is a fool's illusion to think that we're going to address the poverty and inequality by better wage policies. I'm all in favor of better wage policies, but they're not going to do what is needed. We need to find ways of redistributing financial capital. The worst sin of the Thatcher regime was giving away North Sea oil to those privatized companies. So irony of irony, today, one of the biggest stakeholders in North Sea oil, or Scottish oil, depending on your point of view, consists of a Chinese state corporation. Well done, well done. Norway set up a capital fund by which all its citizens receive benefits from this fund that is reinvested all the time. The Alaska Permanent Fund, which was set up, has done precisely the same. It now finances a regular payment to every citizen of Alaska. It predates Palin, and she tried to ruin it. But we've also seen the growth of cash transfers, as Johnny mentioned, in Brazil, when I first went there in the 90s, we were laughed at, ha, a basic income in Brazil, ha. Today, more than 60 million people in Brazil receive a cash transfer every month. It's still semi-conditional, I wish it weren't, but there's a law on the statute books to remove even that conditionality. We have done experiments, and this is on what, the point on which I wish to end, We've done experiments in Namibia, where we gave every person in several villages a basic income and then charted what happened to their lives. And more recently, we have just concluded a major pilot in India. When we started in 2009, 2010, the bureaucracy in Delhi all said, Guy, you're wasting your time. It's crazy. They'll waste the money. It will go nowhere. With SEWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, 
They were converted. UNICEF helped fund it. And for 18 months, we provided 6,000 men, women, and children with a monthly unconditional basic income. Individual, not family. Now, I won't summarize the results, but I want to make four points by way of conclusion. The first one is that it was unconditional. We didn't tell people what they had to do with their money. That's paternalistic. If you believe in a progressive social policy, you must empathize and say, the only difference between them and me is that they're poorer, but they're human beings. So it was unconditional. It was universal. Everybody in the community got it. No means testing, no behavior testing like this. It's nonsense. You can claw back through taxation if you wish. And the third is individual. Now, what's happened? We also tested some of the villages. We had a collective body representing people, Sewa. Some of the villages, no Sewa. Because our theory is that collective voice gives greater strength to the vulnerable. And the results we presented at a conference in Delhi on May 30th and 31st. And I'm very proud of the fact that the Minister of, for Social Development came. He is the Indian minister, cabinet minister in charge of cash transfer policy for the whole of India. He came and at the end he said, this dispels all doubt that the poor will be irresponsible. We have seen child malnutrition dramatically fall. We've used the Z score of anybody who's in public health to see the distribution of weight for age. And what's even more wonderful than when Mozart was playing in my ears when I saw these graphs with our data, because we've analyzed with a randomized control trial comparing with other villages where we've had no basic income, is that the weight for age of young girls improved even more than for young boys. We've seen schooling attendance improve, and schooling performance go up, women's status improve, economic production improve, health care improve in various ways. But the point that I found most dramatic, and I try and make it in an article in the Indian newspaper, the Financial Express, which is circulated for you, is that the basic income grants have been transformative. What's happened is they've given liquidity to people who didn't have liquidity. It gave them a sense of having a greater control over their spending and a greater ability to resist the money lenders and the Nauka system, the bonded labor system. And it released the constraints on them able to borrow little for seeds, for fertilizers, and little things. And we saw a rather strange development, which is, of course, one of the critics of giving people unconditional basic income, is they'll be lazy and scrounge and drink and do all sorts of things. Well, the irony is that what did happen is a reduction of casual wage labor. Horror. But a much greater increase in work on their own farms and their own small businesses, in their own activities, in caring for their relatives. And irony and irony, the greatest beneficiary of the system, bear in mind it's given to everybody equally, is that the people who've benefited most are the disabled, because they suddenly have a voice at the family. They have a voice to say, I count. Now, we're seeing a transformation, and I'm very proud of the fact that, at the moment, there seems to be very po positive mood music, if you want to call it that. Yesterday, I was preparing my talk, and I was actually meant to having, be having a meeting with a very important person in India who has suddenly become enthusiastic. Instead, we sent some of the women from the villages to see her. 
And I'm glad to say I received an email this morning saying she was very enthusiastic by the end of the talk. There's hope, still not a great one, but there's hope that it will be rolled out across India and the minister is encouraging us if we've got the energy to do further pilots. Now, if progressives believe in equality and for freedom for those at the bottom of our society, then they must get rid of the laborist bias that has dogged social democrats for the past century or more. We must strengthen collective voice but I say to you all that the only way to give people in the precariat and give those peasants a sense of basic security is to move towards a basic income as the floor of a structure of social protection. It's not a panacea. On top of that, you need contributory-based systems. You need private and public and other forms of, of social protection. But without a base, we're not going to go anywhere. In this age of uncertainty, we must overcome insecurity. And I'd like to end with a quotation which has always inspired me. And when I came to be writing the 25th anniversary letter to all our lifetime members in Bien, I quoted it. It's from that fine scholar, Barbara Wooden who 44 years ago said, it is from the champions of the impossible rather than the slaves of the possible that evolution draws its creative force. We have made a tiny start. It's up to the precariat to take it to the next stage. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that we moved from the very dismal scenario that uh, Guy spent quite a lot of his talk uh, with, the scenario generated by the politics of the nudge and welfare and so on, to a much more optimistic and uh, uh, you know, hopeful scenario, the politics of agency, citizenship, transformation. So it falls to me to say thank you um, and I, I also did not prepare a text. I only have a few minutes. Uh, but I thought I'd wait to see and hear Guy before I decide what I want to thank him for. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I think I would like to thank Guy for what we will all recognize was not a conventional academic lecture. It was a very passionate and a very committed uh, exposition of his ideas and his... Uh, his way of moving us forward. Um, I met Guy uh, at the end of the 1990s sometime when he was within the ILO, and I had not realized, I mean, I was called to be on the advisory group of his report, uh, exactly how these things worked, and uh, I think uh, John Weeks talked earlier, I think he mentioned the word maverick, but um, I think one of the things that struck me about that report is it, uh, he went about it in a way that I didn't think normally was procedure in these uh, UN reports because he brought in a very interesting group of people for his advisory board, including, of course, myself and some other feminists and psychologists and sociologists and a few people from, from SOAS. And what came out of it, I think, was about insecurity and about justice. And so what I realized, and that was really the first time I'd met him, and I've met him off and on over the years, our paths have crossed. And I've realized, of course, by reading his work, that this has been a lifelong, or at least after he became an adult. I don't know if I thought about it as a child, but certainly a lifelong preoccupation. And it has become clearer and firmer over the years. Um, and what I'm particularly glad about is that he has picked up on that aspect of poverty 
which was often overlooked in poverty studies, and that is, what does it mean to be insecure? Those of us who learned about poverty, we always were told that poor people have very short-term horizons, partly because they're so preoccupied with surviving the present. But I think there is more to short-term horizons. It's that you don't know what the future holds. So how are you to plan for it? And in a sense, the way that Guy is proceeding with his ideas about basic income and a universal social floor is to provide people with that firm ground from which they can think about the future. And I've also just looked up his uh, website, you know, as a way of sort of orienting myself. And you realize that this is a man with a mission who is, uh, I think, in several places at the same time and talking to several different audiences at the same time and probably uttering several different speeches at the same time. But it makes me very pleased that someone has made it their business to really get on top of the facts about what insecurity means. And what is interesting, of course, is Guy's examples today were about Britain. A few years ago, maybe a decade ago, we'd have been talking about the South. But today, those very experiences of indignity, of humiliation, all of that that goes with the workfare, with welfareism, is very much, and he has graphically illustrated it, and he clearly has spent a lot of time studying it, is very much the experiences that we are seeing around us here. So my final thanks to Guy is to thank him for making it his business, to stay on top of what's going on, and to make, to provide a possible way forward. I am very pleased. I knew about this experiment in India. I don't approve of randomized control trials, but obviously you have to do them in order to get some kind of hearing. And I'm very pleased that it seems to have worked. I never doubted that it would work. I am not surprised that poor people are very industrious, given the opportunity. But it is very good to have strong evidence that tells us this is so. So for that as well, thank you.